this is, this is, this is. Yeah, man. Cool. How are you? I'm good. Yeah. Awesome. Hey. How's your day going? Been good, man. I've been watching your videos. What? Are you kidding? Feel, the, uh, on the channel? I feel unreasonably prepared. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. It's all. It's uh, that's a new world for me as far as you know, podcasting and YouTube channel. But that's cool. You've been watching. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's funny because you know, I'm in your space, but we're doing my podcast. So it's okay. It's awesome. Yeah, it's great. Thanks. I'm grateful. I'm grateful that we we have the space. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. I mean, I, I think you know, I've been in this room before, and yeah. it's usually a jam room. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Well, that's so you what just change it up. We call it living in a Volkswagen. So my wife and I lived in a Volkswagen camper bus when we first got married for, I don't know, six or eight months and just drove around the country. And it's one of those things like in order to eat dinner, you have to move this thing over here. And then in order to do this thing, you have to move this thing over here. And you're constantly shuffling the room around to make it work for what you need. So we put the drums away and we set this up. And then tomorrow, somebody's going to have this torn down and we're going to have something else up to film. And then the next day, the drums and all the guitars will be out and they'll be recording some demo. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I mean, the, the fact that you have the space and then you can just switch it around pretty easily. Yeah. I'm selfish because I have my own studio and I always have, I always want to like, once I set something up, I want to leave it there forever. And it yes. never, of course, ends up that, that being that. But but I, I try my hardest to leave things set. Where the, you want them. Where I want them. My son, oldest, and I were just talking about this today because he gets in, you know, he's like, well, I put it away in its spot, but we've got five people who use this space <laughs> and it continue with the homeschooling and everything. And we let the kids just have free reign to be creative, you know, so it's usually just destroyed and there's instruments and camera gear everywhere because we're so adventurous and live such a busy lifestyle. Yeah, you know yeah, absolutely. I, I, that's partly, well, that's definitely a big part of why I wanted to have you on the podcast. Yeah, sure. Because we've gotten to know each other a little bit just ran, just in real life. For and, sure, for and, sure. And uh, just getting to, to hear about some of the things you do, hunting, mm -hmm. survival, um, prepping. Yeah, yeah. That kind yeah. of thing. So it's like, Which, it's okay, a it's, it almost sounds like feels like a dirty word for a lot of people today. <laughs> and it's 100% true, right? It's 100% true. <laughs> but we have some connections too, like in the music world. Some, yeah. Old yeah, ones, I think, yeah, true, yeah. too. So you used um, to play in Project 86? Well, no, I didn't play in Project 86. I just have, so I was You're in band. So bands the bass played. player and oh, I were okay. in a band. Um, and then their drummer for a long time and I are just really old friends. Okay, okay. Um, on coming from you know coming from as a young kid cutting my teeth in punk rock and then moving into like say the christian space or even just regular punk rock space or whatever um excuse me cliffy huntington and i i've known him for a long time we were in yeah. the same kind of general philadelphia baltimore uh you know elkton maryland delaware area pennsylvania music scene at the same time and then i was like i did a band in a band with him for like two shows or something like that yeah yeah way okay, back okay, like in like yes. 92 like we're, we're right. old yeah yeah wow wow so you came out of pennsylvania now you're in texas we're in, well we lived in california for a long time as well my right, wife and i right. did. we lived in northern california where we had kind of quotation marks pre uh, like a prepper paradise kind of a thing where we had 14 acres and it was, we could be off grid and we had chickens and gardens and raised pigs out there with our friends and had a, you know, I had a 10 kilowatt solar system, a 2,500 gallon rainwater harvest system, um, tons of garden beds and about 80% of what we did in our general life was done on that piece of property as far as how we lived. So then we'd go to the lakes and we hunt and all that. How many people to get all together? Just my family, just me and my wife yeah. uh, and our four kids. That's it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Now we're super. I'm very. Well, how did you social. learn how to just trial and error over time? So you didn't grow time. up on a farm. You didn't grow. Did up. not. No, I grew up near Philly, um, in and then graduated high school in Elkton, Maryland. So where did the obsession start? So here's. So that's a funny question. <laughs> I was thinking about that, and it. I I say that it does actually have roots in my um, very anarchist punk rock philosophies. Right. So um, I have you know subscribed to kind of an old school idea of like full self-sufficient full self-reliance full self-governance you know my uh, my idea of anarchy is autonomy autonomy self-governance and not being utterly dependent on somebody else and some other system and mm -hmm. you know to do everything for us and well if i'm going to be not dependent on all these institutions the the financial institution and i'm and i want to be able to live separately from them well then 
I've got to know how to do that to some degree. So mm-hmm. philosophically, I kind of already would, would roll through that. Um, and my mom and dad are kind of preppers as well. If you want to use the term, my, my dad's a safety guy. He's an okay. environmental engineer. My dad's an environmental engineer uh, and ha- did health and safety for a lots of different companies. So he always ingrained in us like, hey, in case of an emergency of any kind, we're going to be prepared for it. Sure. Whether that be for fire, somebody gets hurt. You, you, you stumble upon a car accident, you know, you have uh, some idea of what to do and how to help. Uh, and then my mom was raised by, an, you know, an old army guy who, you know, just stockpiled food and water and, got, and guns and arrow, right? Yeah. And so it's still some amount of there was there. But in my adult years, my wife and I um, were a little different than, our, than my folks in that, like, we're so community minded and we're so social that I would much rather take the idea that. I'm, I would develop my friends and my close knit community um, to be more self reliant, uh, to be so that in case something happens, in California fires are real danger, and if mm-hmm. something happens, um, I am, I am at the ready for my neighbor if their house burns down, right? So they can come to my house, I can go to their house and help them. We can help clean up the property. I've got plenty of food and water stored so that I can help them out. Um, and, and that's kind of the, that's what got me started in it. And then you just start researching. How do you store water? How do you do this? How do you do that? And it just grows into, into something, you know, just grows into, I guess, I guess a passion. Just, I will talk preparedness at this point with anybody who will listen to me just in, to help people be less blindsided when shit goes down, like has happened over the last three years. Right? right, I absolutely would. Yeah, um, and love them through it, and and you know when the winter storm hit last year or a year and a half ago here, we had three families staying in our house because no power, and we had everything. We said just come, so they didn't freeze to death. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah, and so we do a lot of. I personally do a lot of getting rid of the stereotype that preppers are, because many of them are. Don't get me wrong, are this lone wolf, yeah. isolationist live off grid Cons- shooting anybody comes down the driveway conspiracy t- theory conspiracy theory and yeah. i did g- had my seasons of some of those things <laughs> yeah. i'm not gonna lie specifically <laughs> well, like uh, diving into conspiracy theorists and my innate distrust of uh, anything bureaucracy uncle sam you right, know right. i've gone through the gamut of hate you know not liking all of those things and then it just leads you to you know strange paths like this yeah. and um but flipping the scripts and helping people i want to help people man what what I like about what you say is like be prepared, not paranoid, mm-hmm. right? Hundred percent, and, and yeah. that's a big thing. Is like you don't have. It's actually if you're prepared, you don't have to be you paranoid to because be. you're not worried. You're not. You're just right. like okay, something's. If something yeah. happens, I'm good. Um, I mean, should we just dive into some? prep stuff if you want yeah I'm kind of i'm kind of into like the prep prep porn like i don't watch all Dude, the videos I, call, stuff, I call it doomer porn is it doomer porn that's what i call it. i don't know if anybody else i call it doomer <laughs> porn right and 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 it can be really engaging you know because then your mind starts racing on all of these yeah. things i don't do any of that though i don't do doomer porn if it at all. Leave, yeah 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 you're just more like practical and yeah. like this is yeah I, and i like that because i've anybody that's listened to this podcast or, or over any amount of time would know we got some buzzing going on would know that uh yeah we're starting to buzz but that's all right i guess we should be okay burn through anybody that's listening to this podcast yeah. knows that i am a huge fan of the show uh alone dude okay yeah I, if i interrupt you a bunch <laughs> just shut me down right Say, so listen good. asshole talk, shut up so listen, alone. <laughs> of all of the prepper shows or uh, and and survivalist shows there are two that i fully endorse and alone is one of them and then les stroud is another yeah. one Less Stroud. Yeah, yeah, Les Stroud. Yeah, Les Stroud. Survivor so I was thinking He's maybe it was that, but that's not connected. No. Hey, Sea Digs. Uh, you know what? I don't want to. Yes, weird. sir. All of a sudden just started buzzing. Oh, yeah. It's, it's yours. It's my mic. Can you grab another mic for me and we'll just. And we'll keep rolling. You can edit this out or whatever you want to do. Yeah. No it's problem. This one. This. I got to get new mic cables. We abuse the shit out of these cheap mic cables and they. It happens. Yeah. They're studio consumable. Booyah. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Okay. Take two. So I'm just going to start back with Alone. Uh (laughs) Yeah, it's awesome. I love Alone. Yes, I do. We do. We talk about it all the time. Yeah, and and Les Stroud, I've seen a couple episodes. Mm -hmm. I've heard that he's really good, too. Um, The Bear Grill 
It's like all fake. I'm not a fan. It's fake, right? I'm not a fan. Although it's so sensational. Didn't he fall from like a helicopter and break his back or something like that? Okay. So I, li- I mean, it's my. Okay. You can still get hurt. Hold right? on. You can still get hurt. <laughs> He's a legitimate, you know, I think some sort of paramilitary guy in England for sure and has gone through all of that training. But the TV show is really sensational and they right. do a lot of things that I would be like, please don't do that ever. Um, it, it, it takes a, <laughs> what are some things you like should really do? unnecessary <laughs> risks jumping across caverns and things right he's got a full crew there ready to help him um and sometimes i guess you need to take risks but for those of us who aren't like bro i was never in the military mm-hmm. a lot of prepper stuff is real military inspired if you will and i was never i never was in the military i wasn't about to you know anyway i'm not gonna get into that but i was never in the military yeah so i was never military trained on survival tactics I've just done a lot of hunting and camping and backpacking, you know, so I, th- that's kind of where my knowledge from mm-hmm. survival stuff comes from, yeah. just from that. But alone, yes, is legit awesome. That That's kind of like taking your body to the mm-hmm. limit because the, the contestants on alone, mm-hmm. they, they're literally starving. 100%. Wasting away. And you're like, okay, so it can be done. <laughs> it can be done. And it's a really good case in point for the preppers who say, so there are uh, those in the prepper like, well, I have plenty of guns and ammo. And I have some stuff stored and I'll just go hunting for everything I need if shit hits the fan and I'm going to be this lone wolf, right? Right. When we watch as these folks, they can't get everything all the time, right? can't. No, no. We are, yeah. whether you, whatever your, you know, your worldview is, we're designed, we, we, we need to live in some amount of community. We need to help each other out because you have strengths and weaknesses that are opposite or fill in the gaps of what I have. And when we're alone... The reason who wins is because they're just last man standing, not because they're the most thriving on that show, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are some who have semi-thrived, but at some point, they're going to die in the woods if, if the contest doesn't end. There was one guy that like was like, fine, and he's like, I'm not even going to like go and do anything. I'm just going to sit in my tent. I don't remember the season. But like halfway through the show, he's like, eh, I've proved myself. <laughs> I'm I'm quitting. You know, it was like, dude, if you're fine, just keep going. Just keep going. It was too bored or something. Yeah, and that's the other part. People underestimate the mental, the mental capacity of, of any of that. Like, have you ever run out of water? Yeah, you know, you can have all the preparations in the world, mm-hmm. um, but then when you're actually put in the fire, like we ran out of water in California. Complete, turn the tap on, nothing. Really? Dur- during drought. Yeah. That exists. Yes, 100%. That is insane to think With, about. And terrifying. And, 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 and I had a 1,500 gallon tank on my well and 2,500 gallons of stored rainwater, and we still ran out of water because the drought was so bad, our well didn't produce anything for quite a while, mm-hmm. and everything went dry. And so now you're trying to figure out how to take water from your tank and flush your toilets with it. And the mental breaking point for my wife was when I was like, we're going to have to do laundry in the bathtub. And she was like, you can kiss my ass if you think I'm doing laundry <laughs> in a bathtub. <laughs> now, granted, the, the no water coming out of the tap was like a about a three-day process yeah yeah it was about three days and then it started coming back but the drought was so bad this one year what was it 2015 or 2014 we it those of us who lived way out in the mountains many of us ran out of water and some people had none wow you know i mean it's crazy to, to hear stories about you know there's this french family in the desert that went out in the california desert mm-hmm. and didn't have water, like had one bottle of water or something, and they like literally died. Right. This was a, years ago. Mm-hmm. I heard about this story, and I'm just you're just like, one, how does that happen? One, it's like lack of preparedness. You know, you don't really think it's a big deal because we're just so used to being in civilization. Maybe, we are right. Yeah, Western culture. We're we're just used to once again turning it on the tap, and and there's just water there, or going yeah. to the grocery store, and there's pretty pieces of meat wrapped in cellophane. Right. 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 Um, and then, so what do you do when say like the last two years specifically, or when COVID hit is really, um, kind of legitimized some of us preppers. Yeah. And so, um, I started the channel so I could be kind of a reasonable, well, the reason we've heard, but an actionable source Yeah. that think of me as a gateway drug to prepping. <laughs> right? Like yeah. I just want to get people started. However, how, whatever direction okay. you go is up to you, but I still, would love us to be at least prepared enough that in, in the event that some acute situation happened, we could weather the storm well, and then once again, I'm gonna I harp on it, then we're able to serve, serve our better community because, you know, it really it sucks. It's a it's a terrible situation running out of toilet paper and then trying to go out to get toilet paper when everybody else is trying to get toilet paper. Mm-hmm. Um, 
or here's a, a good case in point for you. I was uh, a buddy of mine who I've known for a long time, and he was a drummer in a band, and um, he's just Race a City guy. Yeah, he actually does. He, he his name is Isaiah. He does the podcast with me as okay. well. Um, but we have this this one story we tell where we were in a holiday. You know, grocery store do you have them up in bremerton holiday stores we have in california no. and i said all right let's count it, 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 he was coming visiting us because they had a, a power outage in southern california he was living in southern california so we'll just come on up um and hang out with us so they made the trip they had no gas power this whole grid was down for a period of time uh in southern california where they were living i think maybe san diego or something like that so they came up to visit us and I said, imagine right now if everybody that you can see in eyesight bought one gallon of or just bought two gallons of water, I think is what it was. They bought two gallons of water because an emergency is happening. How much water would be sitting here on the shelf next to us? And we did the math and, the, and there would be no there would have been no water in, in that grocery store. Mm -hmm. I said the grocery store has enough stuff probably just to stock this one more time because we have what's called a just in time, just in time supply chain. So they don't really get restocked for two to three days at a time. That's all they, that's all they do. So, so they bring everything out and restock the shelf and another five, six people come and buy it. In 10 minutes, there's no water on the shelf. You came to the store to buy water. It's all gone. It's a horrible place to be. Right. So what I tell people is if, if you can get yourself prepared for even just a, like a three day event, just a three day power outage or something like that, then you're not adding to an already exacerbated problem when the problem happens. Right. Yeah. Um, you, you, on the very minimum, you can stay at home and weather the storm. Or what we try to do is you have a community of people who are kind of interdependent on one another that can mm -hmm. help each other out. Yeah. Um, and so if I've got provisions, then it's really nothing for me to help my friends who don't right, right right and then from there that becomes a case in point of all right well let's not be apathetic what can you do to get yourself even somewhat prepared and i try to keep it as simple as possible if you wanted to start going that direction we can i don't know what you're I'm yeah hijacking your podcast but um i just love talking about this thing. i like the community aspect yeah. of prepping because you like you said before there's a lot of a lot of like um most people think of preppers as lone wolf as yeah. like let's hoard everything to ourselves well and that's what that tv show depicted yeah. Remember on what was it the History Channel they had um, Doomsday Preppers? Was, did you ever see that TV show? I, I probably watched a couple of clips. Yeah, oh, it was yeah, awful. Yeah. It was such a bad show. I mean, it, it was entertaining. Yeah, entertaining. Don't get me wrong. I'm, uh, Bunkers. Super, and, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and once again, if people want to go do that, and they've got this really incredible Doomsday scenarios that they've worked up to, fine. <laughs> it's fun. Yeah. yeah. The, 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 the issue is, it's not that those things can't happen. You know, the financials collapse could happen it's not that it can't we could do the math on how we've been printing money for the last decade yeah. and we have a fiat currency that's not based on anything i can talk to you about that kind of stuff but that's way too abstract for most people mm -hmm. what i tell people to do is wherever it is you live you know you're in bremerton um, sometimes we're in texas i was in california do a do a small research or most people already acutely aware of whatever your general emergency could happen there whether for mm -hmm. you up there's probably snowfall or heavy rain i'm going to imagine down here it's extreme heat or tornadoes um back east we we would be frozen and start there you know what, what would be the dangers of that regular normal could happen anytime emergency fire was a very real threat in california so most of our preparedness was centered around what happens if a fire ha happens right or drought drought yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so start there just kind of research that but I have my my what I call like the holy trinity of of prepping to start with, where I want everybody to start. I want you to start. Anybody who walks in my door, and I do, and it, it is this. Can in I the, can I get try to guess? Guess guess guess. Uh, well, is it water? Obviously, you have yep. to have water. Uh, medical supplies, some basic medical supplies, mm -hmm. food. Okay, does yeah. that count? You got them out of order. Thing? Yeah, but the same thing. Okay, you got them out of order. So water, food. Water. Water is the first, food is the second, medical is the third. And then from there, you can start branching out on other like gadgets and communications, mm -hmm. radios, uh, camping gear or survival gear. You can branch out there based on your own personal lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, but every single human with an earshot of me, I want you to have three days worth of water, three days worth of food, and mm -hmm. some amount of, of emergency medical kit, what we call boo-boo kits. You can get them at Walmart for basic i cut myself i have some scrapes i got something in my eye i stub my toe i splint my finger because it might be broke some about a basic yeah. every day about my life injury so and and here's how much water i want people to store two gallons per person per day 
in your home for three days, man, woman, or child, doesn't matter, two gallons per person per day, because your son's not going to drink nearly as much, and this is for drinking and cleaning and cooking. That's the bare minimum starting point. Mm-hmm. And, and once again, for a three-day situation, kind of three days seems to be this magic number with a lot of things. Um, there's an article written a long time called three meal, or excuse me, nine meals to chaos or three days to chaos. And the idea was after about three days, people kind of start to panic um, mm-hmm. it, when, when they can't get things. You can only go so three days without water. By the second day, you're severely dehydrated. Air, we are all pretty much, unless nuclear war is happening or some really terrible thing is happening generally speaking 90 percent of five percent of the time we all have clean air Mm -hmm. so start with water just make sure you you have water and you can go go buy the the gallons you know Mm -hmm. from i just go buy the clear not the milk jug ones but the square kind of rectangle with the handle on top they're like 88 cents yeah at heb or walmart or any of those places and just put them on your bed and then you got three days of water for your family if there's no power on it you can still cook bock macaroni and cheese you know um and then your next thing you're going to want to do is some is three days worth of some type of emergency non-perishable canned foods mm-hmm. that are real easy to that require no real cooking canned soups you know corned beef with canned vegetables um you can buy the the dehydrated or freeze-dried survival foods you know for like 30 bucks you can get nine meals of those some mm-hmm. of those are junk but yeah. the, the, but something's better than nothing uh three days nine meals worth of food uh, and then some medical kit and start there. Yeah. That's a perfect place. To, that'll keep you That's busy great. just for a little bit. Yeah. I think we've tried that and we have, we just need to like update it because things yeah. get old. Some of the food gets old. Mm-hmm. I mean, after a couple of years, it kind of, you probably should do that. I don't know. Do you have like a, a set schedule? We do. Yeah, we do. Um, we do it every turn of the year. So so every year every well we inventory <laughs> or what do you do you say that again do you do an inventory and just check check yeah my, my wife is really good at lists and checklists okay right and so <laughs> um in fact on our website and which we're revamping but um even on the channel i have what's called what we call our ice box checklist or in case of emergency box checklist mm-hmm. and that's just a checklist that you go down and be like well so long as i got all these in a box i can live out of my house or if i need to evacuate i can just throw that box in the truck and roll Right, or my vehicle or my van or whatever it is. And mm-hmm. you can download that for free. It's a PDF. Okay. Called, on your site. Yeah, yeah. On, on their site. It's called, we call that the prep, uh, reason paired ice box ch- checklist, right? In case of emergency. Cool. Um, but yes, every year, some people, I know, I have a friend who does it at tax season. <laughs> <laughs> at tax season, when he's yeah. fine, you know, doing taxes and doing this, and they go through their inventory and make sure there's no expired food. You know, make sure the water's still good, right? And, and they'll cycle through what they need to cycle through. Um, if they've dipped into it at all throughout the year, they'll go on their checklist and go, "Oh, well, we need to redo our emergency kit, or, yeah. or excuse me, our first aid kit. I needed to buy another one because mm-hmm. we went out the lake and had to bust it open or whatever because somebody stubbed their toe or any number of oh, things." Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, but turn of the year, ever, I think typically we do it January, February. So. Do you ever eat the the food in there? Mm-hmm. Just so it doesn't go bad, or so yeah, that's what you'll want to do. You want to cycle yeah. through, put that, and now. Canned food has an quote unquote sell by or expiration date, but if there's no dent on the can, if it's not swollen, mm-hmm. it'll pretty much last indefinitely. Um, it, 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 the, they've found canned food from the eighties that it was still good. And then, you know, it'll, it, I, mm-hmm. we still cycle through, but, um, so long as the can isn't damaged, it should be fine. That's good to know. Yeah. yeah it's cool. It should be fine. Um, but generally speaking, yeah, pull the soups and different things out and cycle through and put new ones in behind it and, you know, add, e- either or donate them. You know, if they're foods that you wouldn't ordinarily want to eat on a regular basis because you're super health conscious, like none of us really want to eat canned green beans with a lot of salt in it. Yeah. I like fresh green beans. Right, right. But if it's there for an emergency because it's it's still food that we can eat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Who cares? I, yeah. We, I, I will just donate. <laughs> yeah. you, you can donate it or things like that. Uh, or there's super shelf stable, freeze dried, you know, foods, which I've got a lot of companies now reaching out to. I just had one company send me like, like a month's worth of food for free just to try. And, 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 you know, so they're like, Hey, can you try this out and tell your, tell your, you know, your, your subscriber base, if it's any good or not, we'd love to know. Nice. Okay. And so I'll be doing that. And then we just did a taste test. Excuse me. I went and bought a whole bunch of dehydrated, like prepper camper you know backpacker meals okay and had yeah, all the kids yeah. lined up and we <laughs> we cycled through them because you another thing is when you're buying the food you want to buy food that you'll eat 
Mm-hmm. You know, I, <laughs> I have some other people that I've known who are like, oh, I just stock up on this, this thing. And you'll be happy to have anything in an emergency situation. Well, yeah, but we can buy what we want right now. <laughs> right. Why limit it to just, <laughs> just the worst thing ever? Um, so buy what you eat, you know, yeah. you know, vegetables, meats, you know, canned meats. And I just buy the, the 98% free chicken breast. And then I just mix mm-hmm. that with some rice and boom, you got a meal. Yeah. You know, and throw some chicken stock in it and you got a meal. You can get that. Can, can you get that canned? Yeah. You go to Sam's Club and Costco. Oh, nice. Yeah. They're just canned chicken breast with no salt or anything. It's just literally like you, you just cook, cook it. Yeah. It's like you cook the chicken breast in a, in a pan with no seasonings or anything, chopped it up and put it in a can. Yeah. Or in a, in a pan. Sorry. Um, and yeah. And we just, I just keep those with some rice mm-hmm. and some beans in a five gallon bucket. Um, for like super long term that's you know we've gone there but once again if you just go get some canned chicken canned ham some um you know a bag a bag of rice and vacuum seal it or you know um and you know just a, some canned foods canned soups in a, in a small box that you know will be enough for you uh and 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 your wife and your, and your two kids for a few days when the power comes back on you're not out rushing to the supermarket trying to figure out what the hell you're going to do when everybody else is yeah yeah and you're not fighting with them because yeah. that happens too. I don't know why, but it does. People argue. People well, get crazy. They get they're stressed. Nuts. They, yeah, 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 for sure. Better yeah. to not have to deal with that. Uh, yeah. You know, it's funny. A lot of the reason I started thinking about this stuff was because Washington State, Seattle area, mm-hmm. they're always talking about the big one, the big earthquake. Right. Have you heard of it? Like, well, yeah, California. Yeah. Southern California and Bay Area, same thing. So apparently every, like... Hunt every like I don't know how many hundreds of years happens three hundred years or something like that. There's a huge earthquake, right? And it's, right. it's going to cause a tsunami that like basically takes out all of Seattle, everything up to like I five. Brutal. And I'm, and I'm like, does that mean like just where fall I fall off the or... <laughs> just fall off the cliffs right into the Pacific Ocean? This I, idea. I, I don't know. If it's it's going to be flooded, so I don't oh, know. Okay. If it, it's more of like a tsunami that just. Kind of like uh, what happened in where was it uh, Indonesia or mm-hmm. Thailand? Um, you yeah, know the big yeah right the uh, the big uh, burr, 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 yeah burr, burr, burr. So, tsunami yeah the tsunami, tsunami that came through yeah for sure. So I'm just thinking okay if we survive that mm-hmm. there's going to be no internet no power right for like months right you're right it's going to be a disaster. Let's say let's say because here's where. Some of my philosophical bents and my, you know, and, and, and I try and I, I'm apolitical as far, I'm mean, not personally, but as far as the channel's concerned and things like that, I've got my own beliefs and whatnot. Um, but prepared, this should, like, we should all be wanting to help, right? Um, right. But where I'm going with this is philosophically, it, it's the, the government and bureaucracies have proved over and over and over again through Hurricane Katrina, through the handling of COVID and the whole administration switch and the nonsense that was and the not and the one before that, that they become easily overwhelmed. They can't help everybody all the time, every time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it is it is up to us as a community, as the, the local governance of ourselves to take responsibility for um, be, and be not empathetic for our own safety and for our own lives. Right. And then for the life of our neighbor, I feel like if we all kind of got back to at least that philosophically and stop doing the like, well, that's well, the FEMA is going to come in or the Mm -hmm. government is going to come in or that's why they have that. I understand that they have it. But come on, police that like they're already spread thin now in regular life, let alone when when, you know, a catastrophic event happens. Yeah. I I always kind of view government services as some if you need to use them right. use them but, right but but if you don't don't be lazy you know there's a lot yeah. of people that just be like yeah pick me up when you could just easily walk over there 100 <laughs> percent. like right, right now now take that to an extreme where there's a like catastrophic event and people are panicking and they don't know what to do mm-hmm. and nobody knows who to trust or who to serve but so there's a couple philosophical things behind the have some water food and medical that i like to discuss with people and well and that's like you said don't be apathetic you know don't just say somebody else is going to do it for me mm-hmm. when you're able-bodied and you can do it whatever it is yourself is that the three uns you're talking about yes yeah exactly i've been watching right. your video un, un, well because dude i've been listening to your podcast i'm not gonna lie i i don't know a year or two a couple years i on and off because i listen to a lot of podcasts because yeah. i drive a lot uh, and yours is one. I'm a fan and, and have been for a long time. And my kids are super fans, you know, of MXPX and 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 the Harris. Of course, our kids are friends. So, you know, that, that helps. Yeah. Um, but I'm like, what am I going to talk about? He gets heavy hitter punk rockers and rock and roll stars on this. <laughs> what am I going to do? But 
I but, wanted to talk about this, what you know about hunting yeah. prep. Oh, we'll talk about hunting after That's this, fine. maybe. Yeah, 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 and I'll but, take you out if you want. And you'll probably be leaving soon, but you know, when you guys come back for when it's winter time, that'll be the time I go help Texas with the pig population. And, oh, and yeah. We'll that meat. That, that, um, yeah, but, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Yeah. Let's get to So here we go. Uns. So here's a couple of, well, <laughs> and a couple of the philosophies. So the uns, yes. Get un, <laughs> un, uh, unapathetic. Yeah. Get undependent and get unaddicted. Right. So mm -hmm. um, what I tell you is, number one, take responsibility for your life and that of your, com your greater community, because we've got everybody in the world vying for our attention on the Internet and the news and the political stratosphere and what's going on in Russia, all pandering for our emotional, spiritual and mental attention right. and how bad everything is. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, if I just step back for a minute, what I what I try to do is be like, hey, let's let's think about what I actually have a sphere of influence on, right? Like mm -hmm. my, my relate, my responsibilities are for me, my relationship with God, my relationship, with my wife and my family and my relationship with my greater community. That's, th that's what I have influence over. I have any control I have and I can do anything about elections and politicians and, and red men and, and all like everything I have zero other than I can vote. Right. I really have no authority in that sphere and nor should I be really stressing. I'm not saying don't know what's going on in the world. I'm just saying don't take responsibility for things that aren't yours and do take responsibility for what you have in your possession right now. And that's for me, my wife, my kids, and the people that I'm in community with or friends that I know. It's very stoic. Yeah, that, if I focus on that and not mm -hmm. the noise that everybody else is trying to vie for my attention on, then I can put my priorities in place and I'm not as stressed out either. Right. Uh, and then so get so then there's get undependent. That's the same idea that I've been talking about since I was a little kid. And I even found out what anarchy is. And the, the, the and that is what I call autonomous self-governance. And that is to stop assuming someone else is going to do for you what you can do for yourself and to not be dependent. Like our system is cool. I like it. I like the fact that we can go to the grocery store and Western culture and get what we want. Mm -hmm. But my statement is don't be so utterly dependent on it that you can't live without it. Right. 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 Yeah. So th that's a big thing and it takes time. It takes some training and we've been trained over the last, you know, um, in, in Western, this type of, uh, capitalist culture that well, we just consume, we just go buy, we just go buy. And then what we don't consume, we waste. Right. And I'd like us to not think that way, at least within my circle, yeah. I, I would like to, uh, not think that way. I always, to interject for one second, yeah, I literally think to myself when I have a plastic sandwich bag or a larger Ziploc bag, yeah, I think someday this is going to be like gold, or could, could be, could yeah. be, not necessarily is going to be, but I'm just like in a world where you, every you just can't get anything, cents. yeah. But right now, this is like a one-time use, throw it away. Mm -hmm. But but I was just just kind of taking a, a minute to like acknowledge that this is probably a luxury to some people right if you're well, on a desert island and you find sure. a ziploc bag you're gonna you're gonna use that for something that you need to like survive with or whatever right right so i think about that a lot of times and and go well but for now i'm good okay. I ain't talk to it. <laughs> listen I'm, I, and i don't want to demonize anybody because once again i love the fact that i can go buy all yeah these yeah of course but i still want to you know i it there, obviously there's heavy debate on you know climate change and human and human induced version of that or global warming or anything like that um and it becomes these once again people vying for your attention on what you should and shouldn't do and how you should and shouldn't do it and how we're going to legislate each other to do it or regulate and i'm like well hold on if i just take responsibility for my own waste and how i'm wasting and i just work as diligently as i can to not waste as much and use most of what i can which i'll admit is challenging and i'm not you know i'm not pious or so arrogant to think that i don't get it i'm clunky with it but still to at least have that in my mind and understand i need to be cognizant of this uh, my wife is as well and she's on board and she's even well my wife's healthy a uh, healthy touch of hippie right so like she's okay. constant you know she's more granola crunchy hippie with with things and trying to do everything is you know from the earth natural, natural as possible yeah. yeah yeah um and so i mean there was a long time we we rarely even had waste in our trash because we did something with everything we had especially when we we're out on property um and only really had enough trash to go to the dump every once in a while because everything else got used for a purpose whether that was i was heating my house 
uh, with wood and I needed the, the paper products to start the fire, things like that. We would, you know, we would try to at least, and we still do that to some degree here living in Waco or in the, you know, in the city kind of, this is to us, the city, this right? city. Yes. I mean, this is more of a yeah. city w than where I live in Bremerton. In Bremerton. Yeah. And where we were in California, we had no neighbors, right? Like we didn't literally had, mm. they were all either pot farmers or just, you know, like, uh, ranchers right out there. So, um, our hill was a good community, but I didn't have any neighbors really that I could see. Like we were that right. kind of isolated, but, but man, everybody we knew, whether it's from our church or any, you know, the homeschool stuff we do, or just friends that I have outside of all of those, everybody was came to our property all the time because we're that social. Mm. And then they're like, well, how do I do this? How do we do that? Kind of like you're asking. Yeah. So I would help. Um, it, so, and then the, the third one is going to be unaddicted. Oh, oh, undependent. No, undependent. The second facet of undependent is um, if you're dependent on something like, uh, say, a high blood pressure medication or um, medication mm -hmm. and diet for diabetes, basically something having to do with your lifestyle choices, take responsibility and get healthy. Yeah. Because it's, it's going to, it will and has sucked in, in pockets of places, like if something like that happened there or Katrina, where the supply chain is so disrupted in your area, where you can't get it. Now, all of a sudden, what, you're about to have a heart attack just because you're overweight and can't get out of the city. I mean, I don't hate to demonize people, and I don't want to fat shame or anything, but what I'm saying is if we're dependent on something just be from lifestyle choices, mm -hmm. Not and and I'm not talking about chemical imbalances that um, you know they have no control over. I'm not talking about type one diabetes. I'm not talking about those things. I'm talking about lifestyle choices. Mm -hmm. If we're just unhealthy, then maybe it's time to to get undependent on those things and maybe change our diet, get some exercise, you know, go running, breathe the fresh air, walk out into the mountains, um, and kind of wean yourself off of needing the doctors and big farms fixed quick fixes for you sure right and then unaddicted is number one um if we're addicted to drugs and alcohol i want us to get help uh uh reach out if you're in you know mental health is important um chemical addiction is i mean i've lost so many friends to heroin that i can't count anymore it's so sad we just had a, a um, my, one of my wife's oldest friends she overdosed this weekend um, and and because the fentanyl lay stuff too. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And then they, I had my closest friend's dog and his wife, dog boy, from back east. Mm. Um, which ironic, he was at one of your shows and did like some real dangerous stuff. He talked about it all the time. <laughs> back in Shippensburg, he climbed to the top of, I guess, the speaker assembly or something, and like tried to jump <laughs> at one of your shows. It was you guys in like Goody Hook or something in like '94 or oh, something yeah. like that? Right, '95. '95. Yeah. 95, yeah, back yeah. Then. Anyway, he wow. talked about it, but um, poor him and his wife, they just couldn't kick it and we'd get on and off and on and off. And, and, and I want to have grace and love people and know that I've been addicted before too. So I understand how difficult it is, um, but you're worth it. Anybody hearing, I would say you are absolutely worth it as a human being. I know Mike's heart, my heart is please get help, whoever it is, mm -hmm. you know, and if you're in a situation where the people around you are toxic, it's better to leave those toxic people and seek out good people who genuinely want to help you doctors um there's plenty of places to get help now where there wasn't even when we were kids or younger so do that um and then just get unaddicted to like media and Me, i was gonna media. say like for preppers they need to get unaddicted to like their own like the obsession hubris. right for sure but for sure but we all have that right with the yeah. media thing because whatever it is that your your uh, algorithm feeds mm -hmm. you is yeah. what you secretly and that want. dopamine hit boom yeah. boom boom right? is right there for you yeah um uh, so social media is a huge one for me i already don't like it like i've never uh, my attention deficit disorder i don't have the attention mm -hmm. span to really sit there and burn through that kind of stuff i was never really like a gamer or anything like that that's another thing if you're you know addicted to video games and all you do is play video games man go please go out and interact with some real people not through headset and or your thumbs. A, a video game prepper would actually have to have a, a mini solar setup, <laughs> yeah. right? Oh, yeah, so like, you would. I'm not giving you up. You have to generate your own electricity for yeah. sure in that way. Yeah. yeah. I'm not giving up video games. I'm just going to prepare for the... I guess. But that, that's <laughs> to me, I'm like, why would I spend all this money? Because those things are expensive on that when I could just not play video games. But um, And then little things like... Um, and this is a dependent, addicted type thing. Um, I, I, I always tell people to be out of debt. 
Don't be a slave to somebody else paying them money. I understand I have a mortgage and things, but the unsecured debt or just trying to consume and buy things on debt mm -hmm. to to satiate or feel like you need these things. We don't. There's so much stuff we don't need that we think we need. We, sure. don't, we don't really. Um, and so don't be in any debt. If you can't just pay for it, then don't buy it. You know, maybe live a little bit more simply and stop worrying about, you know, what the culture says you have to own. You know, maybe mm -hmm. it. Make healthy choices. I mean, this will yeah. help even if the world doesn't end. And right. It's just the same tomorrow. So that's what All Malia that, tells people. Right. So when we talk about preparedness, because it's almost like a dirty word. Makes preppers, you a like, better person in a way. We, yeah. She's like, well, what we do is we just do things that make our lives better now. And if nothing happens, we'll just be better off. Absolutely. Right? So yeah. in other words, I'm not just storing things I might use one day mm. in, if in the event that maybe, maybe. What we try to do is like, no, we get ourselves into a lifestyle so that if something happens, we're prepared. And if nothing happens, we're just, we're fine. We're better off anyway. We're not, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then. Well, I mean, if you're addicted to something that's going to kill you. Right. It's better to not do that. Please get don't. off that. Yes. Even if the world doesn't end. Yeah. I, and once again, as a human being, yeah. I would, I, you know, and even as a. Anyway, my even, as a not, is, even as an alien, yeah, even as an alien, <laughs> please, you know, you're, yeah, uh, and it's how it's difficult to sound sincere saying it, yeah. you know, just talking here like you, but genuinely, I, I the more I hope I don't want to lose any more people to something as silly as the fentanyl and heroin, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's not necessary, and now our mental health, given that everybody is addicted to social media, and we have a what I'm calling like a counterfeit version of what our lives really are, instead of dealing with whatever the reality of our life mm -hmm. is. Um, is it's dangerous. I mean, it's, or at least we're seeing some of the effects of it. It's concerning to me, at least, you know, it's concerning. Um, and then, but there are little things like my wife, you know, and when we moved back to Waco, she just didn't use any GPS or any maps to find out where everything was in Waco. She just did the hard work of mm -hmm. buying a map and going, Oh, it's here and getting lost. She got lost quite a few times, okay. but now she knows where all of those things are and yeah, she doesn't yeah. need the phone to tell her. <laughs> it took me like three years. Now I don't need, for most things, I don't need to use GPS. Right, right. And, and but every now and then, if it's like a new place or something, but yeah, I just fit, I just try to find it. But um, okay, your 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 earthquake. So here's my yeah, so okay. water, food, medical. Just get those. That's your first. I like quick wins. You know, Dave Ramsey likes quick wins with the little snowball thing. And any good financial advisor worth their weight and salt will say, you know, have an emergency fund, right? Well, that's all we're talking about is having a food and, and water emergency fund. That's really right. all we're talking about. Um, and then the next thing I would do with your wife and with, um, uh, with your kids and Caleb and I'm my oldest, he and I are about to do, it. we just did it, but we're, we're going to release a podcast called growing up prepared and what living in a lifestyle with us was has taught him mm -hmm. um, about real life and regular life because he's 20 now. So we get to see the fruit of how we've raised our kids, whether we did it right or wrong, right? Right. And so <laughs> he's a good young man and he's, he's got a good head on his shoulders. And, and so he, he's, you know, we're talking about um, growing up prepared. And the weird paradox of it is you think that if you talk to your kids about some of the, the things you, you were talking about that you're gonna just creep, freak them out mm -hmm. and they're, they're gonna be afraid. And kind of the, the op, it just depends on how you handle it, like any parenting right. thing, how you respond and react and do it. Um, but I would say um, have a plan. Have some type of rudimentary evacuation plan that you and your wife, and to the responsibility levels and to the maturity levels that your kids can handle it, mm -hmm. be involved in it. And that would be you've got water, you've got food, medical, and then you've got some sort of um, emergency go bag that belongs to them and belongs to you that you're like, hey, if if we have to leave because there's an earthquake or maybe there's a fire or, you know, or or some, you know, uh, a, a bad storm happens, which are all n normal, they could, then we're able to. Yeah. And, and they've got something they can take ownership of, like this little bag with their clothes in it and they put something special on it. You know, that's what we did with our kids and they were color collated they weren't tactical mean weird looking they're like right. ellie had a pink backpack and you know and <laughs> yeah. they've got a change of clothes in it they've got some little water some snacks something that they like and the few things they might need in case you need to do like a hotel extended hotel stay mm -hmm. right and they're just available in a closet under the bed and you've you've spoken with your children about it and you've maybe even said hey guys go grab go grab your packs throw them in the car let's see you know and then you just kind of determine as the, the dad and mom oh that took us about three four minutes actually if we needed to evacuate because the house and the ground is shaking we could and then know where you're going 
You know, am I going to my in-laws? Am I going to my mom and dad's house? Are they, you know, am I driving an hour away to a buddy's house? Who knows I might be coming if, if something happens because it's safe there. Um, and we're a reprieve for other people where they'll just call us or text us or let us know, hey, we're on our way because same thing happened in California. Um, some of our friends had to evacuate because there was a fire on their property. Uh, and I'm like, all right, pack up and come. They pack up, they come. They're at our house in 35 minutes where there is no fire, you know, mm -hmm. 40 minutes where there's no fire. So same idea, know where you're going. Yeah. So have a basic, just rudimentary, not stressful em emergency plan and and drill it to some degree. Um, and it sounds kind of militant, but I mean, just do a quick practice a couple times. So, and then if there is an emergency as the, the, the more mature, you can keep calm and you could say, Hey, we're going to grab our backpacks now. Oh, why? Well, we're going to be going over to uncle Chris's house, uh, and stay with him for a couple of days because something might've happened or, you know, any number of things could be anything. Um, and have a, a, a plan in place to do that. Mm -hmm. And if you have water, food, medical and a plan, you're ahead of most people right of course most anybody we don't have a plan yeah and it doesn't have to be anything <laughs> we have crazy. A, loose, a pretty loose plan like yeah <laughs> but but yeah we don't have like an exact like definitely doing this definitely doing mm -hmm. this but yeah i mean that that just even thinking about doing this podcast i realized okay I've, maybe we've been prepared in the past but right now mm -hmm. we're not prepared yeah and They're like you fall out of preparedness yes we we did I told you we had a prepper paradise. We moved to Idaho. We moved sure. here. We had some tumultuous things happen in our in our family and relationship, and 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 then we went from living once again way out in the middle of nowhere to right here in a hundred and six year old house that we're trying to renovate in the middle of Waco. It's a learning curve, and so we're having to reorganize our preparedness. And there were things I didn't need out there that I do need here, and vice versa. Right. So you know, I had a battery backup solar power system up there. I didn't worry about if my power was going out or not, mm. but here. It's a very real threat, so I had to go buy a generator because I don't have a solar system on the house with a battery backup. So I went and bought a you know six hundred dollar generator that runs gasoline, propane, or natural gas. So if something happens and we need power, we have it. Yeah, you know, great. Um, I still would consider that further down the road for a beginner. You know, um, get that water, food, medical, but it's still something to consider. Is to even a small, you can go to Harbor Freight and get a generator for three hundred fifty bucks mm -hmm. that will keep your refrigerator running and some lights on if you need to. I bought one big enough to be able to handle um, my air conditioners. That's a biggie here yeah. in Texas. Yeah. So I did buy one big Ooh. enough for that. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that's that's a perfect example, though. Texas being there's been multiple years where there's been extreme weather, mm -hmm. hot and cold. Right. And still they're asking residents to keep their air conditioning, you know, right off, you know, in certain times or right. whatever. But it's just like. They're just going to put it on the people every time. Yeah. And so we have to recognize that and you have to honestly. Yeah. You have to take their word for yeah. it that you're not going to get help from the government. Mm -hmm. It's just the way yeah. it goes. And you got, you know, any of the companies that own, own our electricity that we basically rent from, which is why we sold her because I didn't want to rent electricity anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, but that's I mean, the reality is 98 percent of the world rents electricity. Yeah. Right. That's just the way it is. Um, and they kind of they kind of hold the cards. Right. Like the they get to determine how they do and don't turn on electricity on and off. We pay them for that privilege too, by the way. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're, you know, when we got all these businesses in bed with uncle Sam and all that, and they're all protecting each other, then there's, we have little recourse and we're just, so we have to recognize that I don't like it. I can complain and bitch and moan all day about it, or I could at least do something on the back end about it. Knowing yeah. that generally speaking, my life is comfortable. I got two air conditioners and a 3,500 square, like my house is stupid. I don't know how I got it. House and you got one. it fixed recently. We got well. We got two brand new air conditioners installed when we moved in. Brand new. The whole I did redid the entire system when we moved in. Okay. Um, and so that helps for sure, and it keeps the place nice and cool. So most of the time when things are nice, come on, I'm living off the fatty calf here. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But just to recognize, they're not there to help me. They're just renting me electricity, and that's their function. Um, and once again, um, going back to say FEMA, American Red Cross, the government itself. I'm glad that there are people who do those jobs and I'm glad that there are people who want to help, but there are only so many people to do that job versus how many people get affected by Katrina. Right. And, um, I, I would much rather prepare and do all of these things like I'm talking to you and, and, um, 
aid those people in rebuilding my community instead of abandoning the community and hightailing out to somewhere else and bugging out and telling them that they got to all go basically go fuck themselves, my neighbors. And I'm just not into doing that. So we, there's another thing I, in the today's culture that's strange to me is that um, we're so on these phones and we don't even know who our neighbor is next door. You know, we've mm-hmm. never even really met them. That happens a lot. Yeah. Um, and so when we first moved in here, we got broken into. We didn't have a security up yet or anything. We got broken into. And so I was like, well, this is a better time than ever. So I went to every neighbor on this entire block all the way around here. I was like, hey, just want to let you know we got broken into. You guys, we're not expecting anything from you. We just wanted to be good neighbors and let you know that somebody there was some crime. They didn't catch them yet. So just be on the lookout, all of that. you know. And they're like, well, thanks for telling us. you know. And then all of a sudden we meet. And, we, and we're giving each other cookies. That's and, big. Yes, we meet. And, and so that translates into, you know, the park behind the house here. Um, four doors down, some lady was walking her dog, and there's some guy making her really uncomfortable. Uh, and he and he really uncomfortable. like. And so she just hightailed it and came in and just literally knocked and opened my door, right? And we're like, what's going on? And she's like, there is a guy. And I look, and right there in front of her house is this guy standing there with his arm crossed staring at her. Looking nefarious. Creepy. Yeah. Right? I, it was creepy. And I'm like, well, yeah, come in now. Yeah. Come in now. So then <laughs> I walk outside. I walk to the front of my yard and I just make eye contact with the gentleman and I wave. I'm not mad or mean. I'm not ready to fight him. I'm just making it known that I see you. How are you? Mm. You're wearing a white shirt and some sweatpants. And he uncrossed and, and he walked away and I was able to walk her home. But poor lady wouldn't like how would she have known to come to my house if i never introduced myself right you know to keep her safe right that's yeah. great yeah that's something that i've really uh been trying to do more and more in my even just in the last couple of months mm-hmm. to be honest is be more open with people yeah especially people you know neighbors mm-hmm. um it, it really makes a huge difference yeah it's insane so, yeah a neighborhood that knows each other is a safer neighborhood yeah. for sure yeah um and and we just do that because, and then, it, you know, it's it's a lot of like a whole bunch of little case and points I can point to as mm-hmm. to the whys of you know basically it's how I sell salt for lines preparedness, but you know not just after that winter storm uh, in one of our neighbor's communities um this older lady had a massive oak tree fall in her front yard almost on her home and covered her driveway and you couldn't access her home, mm-hmm. so my buddy and two or three friends all called up, hey man. Bring the chainsaws and we're over there clearing her property for her so that she can just get into our home. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, same. And the same thing happened right across the street here where a pecan tree fell in their yard and they couldn't get in. So okay. Caleb, my oldest, is like, well, I'll just come over and start chopping it up for you. And and they're grateful. Right. Yeah. And then they're not having to call somebody and spend a thousand dollars or wait for Waco to come clean it up for them. Mm-hmm. And and we got pecan out of it. So I cook with pecan. I got a whole bunch of pecan back. Here, right? <laughs> nice. Um but it's that kind of stuff. Good. And, and I just, whoa. I, I, we're not fast enough. <laughs> that's all right. We're not, I don't think so th- that's, that's the basic premise is I'm that's too cool. community minded for my own good, even though I'm not like, that's, you know, like a communist or anything. I just yeah. would much rather have relationships with people close by and know each other and we can help each other out and we can be our own first line of defense. And then where we can't do it. Mm. Yes, there are fire stations. I'm not going to fight a fire next door I, with my garden hose. I understand that that's true. But what I can do is help them evacuate and get them into my home or, or put them in my truck and get, you know, help get their stuff out of the house mm-hmm. because I know them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and and then hopefully if we all kind of do that, we become this interdependent network of, you know, I'll do that with you. You're 10 blocks over. Then from there, we've got another 10 blocks covered, mm-hmm. you know. And if a tornado came through and it missed my house and hit yours, Mike, all right, I, we got two bedrooms upstairs that are now – the Herrera bedrooms, <laughs> you know what I mean? Which right. we've done. We've done that yeah. before. And to, to once again, completely get rid of this lone wolf, um, the everyone is my enemy, uh, when shit hits the fan and people panic, uh, I've got to hightail it because everyone else is dangerous. I mean, maybe I'm naive, um, but I just think that's more destructive than uh, building up it's, strong communities. It's kind of what we've been taught through, like, movies and mm-hmm. media and, and tv shows and yeah it, that obviously there's you know stick to your own but then there's the other mm-hmm. and of course that that can happen but yeah but 
assume not assuming it straight away is what you're saying yeah yeah and i would even contend that some of the social unrest and turmoil we've been seeing over the last number of years is the idea of becoming so like kind of self with the social media and stuff focused in having these walls where anybody who has some sort of uh, political or philosophical or religious difference than me is an enemy as opposed right. to just somebody I, I, I disagree with yeah uh, and man uh, fellow american that you may not agree with <laughs> right 100 percent, 100 percent. and and i mean how prideful would i be how my hubris if i believe that all the answers that i think that i have are all the exactly the right answers and everyone that you have are all exactly the wrong answers mm-hmm. was a dickhead move um and I, I i would hope that i would be able to learn from you and the differences that you bring to the table for me and and if we can get back to at least some amount of com- being community minded mm-hmm. um and uh, what we call sometimes in the prepper world mutual assistance groups or mags mutual assistance groups where we have a, a network of people mm-hmm. that like you know doctors and firefighters and military men and engineers that we become friends with and form a community with so that if some something does happen we're able to help and rebuild and 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 sustain as opposed to just doing what i'm going to believe is the cowardly thing and just hightailing it out to a bug out property mm-hmm. and uh, if you want to do that fine that's fine. But don't expect that civilization in the worst case scenario is going to rebuild itself if you hightail it out of here. You, <laughs> yeah. Don't expect that. And I think I still have a little bit more faith in humanity that we can have conversations like this and we can help one another out and we cannot agree on religion and we cannot agree on politics, but we can agree that we're human beings and we wouldn't need one help out. One <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, yeah. I like I like that. We need more of that in our society, in the, right. in the conversation, especially on social media. Everything oh, seems to be so caustic. negative. Yeah, it, and it's getting more and more caustic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People, for sure. Yeah, fo- I, you know, I follow a couple like positive things just because it's you know, and it's so cliche to do that, but it's like you have to like literally follow something that's branded as a positive mm-hmm. news right news outlet. Yeah, that only has good news, and it's just right. like, why do we need that? Well, we we need that. We do now. I don't know why we need it, but we need it. But yeah, yeah. Well, because we're once again addicted to the dopamine hit of tragedy and the dopamine yeah. hit of yeah. of stress. I think we, you know, what? the end the, of the world. The end of the. We become addicted <laughs> to the uh, to like uh, chaos or yeah. addic- You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and whew. well, uh, let's talk about. Uh, I mean, you, you I love talk about chaos, hunting. but I do want to talk about hunting. You know, because it all fits in with just having more autonomy, mm-hmm. having, you know, more self-reliance. I agree. It teaches a lot. It teaches us patience. Um, uh, when I'm um, hanging out or teaching newbies. Um, Before we yeah, get, go ahead. what kind of hunting do you usually do? So I do a lot of deer hunting and okay. a lot of pig hunting. Okay. Okay. With um, rifle? With rifle. Yeah. With rifle. Now, pig hunting is a little different here in Texas because they're um, a problem. Right. And yep, yep. Uh, Texas is trying to get as many people to because uh, they're a non-indigenous invasive species. Right. So and um, they, they just, have. A, yeah, they, they pro- procreate like crazy and they're incredibly destructive. Uh, and they're not even once again, they were introduced, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago to Texas. So the, 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 there's not a lot of natural predators for them. Uh, and so they just take over, you know, and they're really destructive and they're dangerous. They can be very mean mm-hmm. um, and they can hurt you. Um, but they are at the end of the day, pigs. And if you're not a vegetarian or vegan, um, and you do eat meat, um, there's something that happens to people when I walk them through the process of what it means to actually kill something and process it and then eat it. Uh, and we've lost our relationship with food in general in Western culture. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's we take it for granted, and then we're just then we're just mad and irritated when the shelf goes empty. We don't really understand why the cost of those goods and services are the way they are, uh, and what the cost in general is. You know, like the life cost is mm-hmm. to you know mass producing meats and vegetables and things like that. And then also it teaches us you know self reliance and survival tactics and and ways that we can produce instead of consume um, is to hunt. And then another thing that some people don't know. Um, who might be, say, city folk or um, just not as understanding is uh, most hunters that I know anyway, and they are, are, are conservationists. It actually behooves us to conserve our lands and the game well mm-hmm. so that we have a, a legacy to continue hunting. And so what we're trying to do is um, ethically hunt and ethically 
you know, take care of these animals. Now, there is an argument to me that, you know, if there were no regulation and things of that nature, we would just do what we did to the buffalo mm-hmm. or, or things like that. And I understand that. Um, but at the same time, we don't live in those times. And we do have a more under and better understanding of game biology and game management. And then, once again, our own personal lives. There's something mm-hmm. kind of primal about it. I'm not going to lie about hunting and shooting and, and killing and I, I don't want to some people just sugarcoat it and they'll use other terminology like oh we're just harvesting this uh, harvesting a this thing I'm like, no no you're killing an animal you're taking its life and, yeah. and you're cutting it open and you're eating it like I mean I'm, I'm that's what's happening in the reality um, but it teaches you the value of all of that yeah of all of it um, and and it's difficult and strenuous it's mentally challenging physically challenging um, so it's a good exercise and you're out in, you know, God's green earth, you know, breathing deep the wilderness and, and all of, you know, life. It's kind of neat in that way as well. So it is an experience. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm actually grateful for a new resurgence of people who are wanting to learn about that and do it, you know, whether it's bow hunting or rifle hunting, you know, even like the Joe Rogans of the world and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause I think it's important to you know. Bow, any bow hunting? So I go bow hunting, but I must not be very good at it because I've never actually killed anything with a bow. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, it, bow hunting is hard work. Uh, and you I like I said, closer? A little much, bit. much closer. Yeah. And when you're talking about the difference, I can take a, a, a safe 130 yard shot on a deer, but I got to be 30 yards away to be really safe. Anything more than 40 or 50 on a bow, I don't feel comfortable shooting, and I'm not going to shoot at that animal. Maybe some people might just log that thing down to see what happens. But if I can't ethically, you know, shoot and kill that animal as fast as possible so it doesn't suffer at all, mm. um, I'm not going to do it. So I've, I've not shot animals many, many times um, just because I wasn't comfortable with the environment that I was hunting in, mm. um, as opposed to just blasting away at everything that moves. Um, and... Uh, so I like teaching people how to, A, handle a firearm and firearm safety and what it is they're doing with the four, uh, and B, harvesting their own food, whether it be through gardening and, you know, raising chickens or raising rabbits and things like that, um, all the way in, into hunting. Yeah. I do enjoy doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, the thing you don't really hear about a lot is when you get a kill and you get your, mm-hmm. and then having to carry it back to the truck or yes. carry it back to wherever you know mm-hmm. like what's uh i mean is that always like no matter what always an insane process it can be depending on the size of the animal yeah if we're talking about a 1500 pound elk that's an incredibly different experience than a 100 pound deer okay right okay. yeah sure um and so you're you, you're having a process of hiking in for like elk and things like that. You can either pay for a hunt or you go to public lands or things like that, uh, and, and that's a massive animal. So that's another thing to consider if you're hiking four miles into the woods. My brother did this two years ago where he hiked um, a far away into he was in Idaho into the woods uh, and he's deer hunting, um, and he he saw a lot of deer on that trip. He didn't see any of the deer that he thought he needed to shoot nor were worth it to hike out four more miles. So once again, the the idea that us hunters are out there just blasting everything, he actually let all 20 animals that he saw lived because he didn't find the oldest, most mature one who need to be culled anyway so the the rest of the herd can grow up and the young bucks can come in and move in. Um, He didn't see that one, so he came home and didn't have any meat. Mm. That's part of hunting as well. Yeah, Uh, And learning that not everything is instantaneously gratifying. Uh, and that it's hard work. There, there are. I can't tell you how many preppers I hear go. Well, I'll just go out and hunt, and the shit hits fins in there, and I'll be shooting. No, you won't. It's hard work. <laughs> it, there are times you, and the moment you start blasting away at animals, they're going to get wind of it, and they're not going to be in the area. You're, yeah. Just that they intuitively know that they want to not die. <laughs> right. Right. You know, where are all the places you've hunted? Is you don't have to name each, but maybe each state. Yeah, or, California. Uh, okay. Idaho, Texas. That's it. Those are the three states I okay. hunted in. Yeah, and most of them in California and here in Texas. Is there a, a dream hunt that you want to maybe go somewhere? I would someday? love to go on. Um, yes, I would. My son and I both want to go on a moose hunt in Canada. Canada. Yeah, up Ca- near Canada, Alaskan Canada. Mm-hmm, like way Canada up moose north. hunt. Yeah, yeah. But that's his dream hunt uh, that he wants to do. My my middle son who loves to hunt and loves to fish. Um, his dream hunt is caribou in in 
in Canada or some yeah some yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, once again humongous animals insane you know? we 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 are we have uniqueness in Texas because there was a huge uh, exotic game hunting uh, there is and was all over texas so texas doesn't regulate um exotic game as they come in so you as a private property owner you own three thousand acres you can bring in game from africa and from india and all of the kind of stuff and then you can charge for hunts right well since the 60s that's been going on and they get out now texas is populated with incredible exotic animals all really? over texas and they're not regulated like what kind of animals are we axis deer okay uh fallow Gems Bach, which are like What's these fallow, fa white fallow deer. They're called oh, they're, yeah, white deer. and brown. They're type of they're type. They look like a really small caribou or reindeer. They look okay. like, kind of like that. Um, uh, are they reindeer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scimitar orcs. Is, this thing has these big, <laughs> long. My brother shot one on my parent. My family has property down in South. That well, in Texas that they hunt. Okay, and one wandered on this humongous scimitar orcs. Wow. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, there's all matter of different types of goats, you know, and sheep and you, yeah, you just go hunt them. You know, if they're on, if you can find private property or anybody who has public property or prime public property, anybody's private property that you shoot on, you can shoot crazy animals here. Axis deer, fallow, I mean, all, all kinds of them, just all kinds. Kudu, something called a kudu with this big long neck and these little stubby horns. Mm -hmm. Um, it got canceled because everybody got sick. But last year I had booked a, a a stag, a red stag hunt, which are beautiful elk looking animals. But they're not from here. So Texas doesn't really care. They don't regulate <laughs> yeah, it. They don't regulate it. They're not supposed it. to be here. Yeah. They're, <laughs> hey, and and that's key. You can put quotation marks on because a lot of these animals, like the pigs, have been here for 400 years. Right. right. Well, then are they really not from here? <laughs> so how are you hunting the pigs? I'm hunting the pigs with rifles. You're not you're not getting in the helicopter like I am Ted, not. Ted I have not done that. You know he lives right up the road, by the way. I don't know if he does. He that. yeah, he's a nut. He's a, in fact the property that I have that I hunt is connected to his. Okay. Yeah, so I see him all the time. Yes, he's a nut. He's <laughs> he's a nut. Um, he's nice enough as a like, hey, how's it yeah. going here? But he's crazy nut, uh, and he's uh, anyway. Um, but is over there, so he's actually I could drive you over there because this is all high fence, and he has really beautiful animals that you can look at. Um, take you and Rody and and uh, Sailor over there, and because and, they've got he's got scimitar orcs, fallow. Oh, let's do it, yeah. Sitka deer. <laughs> yeah, he's got a uh, little black buck. They're beautiful. It's That'd like awesome. a, it's like a zoo driving yeah. past his property. It's beautiful. Um, but uh, all that to say, so the pigs I am hunting day or night. You can hunt them at night here. Um, and I know that they're in the public eye and on, you know, from center to left leaning, they're the mean AR-15s are, are, are the, the mean gun. But um, when you're shooting, when you've got a hundred hogs that come up mm -hmm. and they're destroying everything, um, yeah, I shoot um, with multiple rounds as fast as I can. And then I, I figure out how to give away the meat, donate the meat, put it in my freezer, sell it to friends who might want to buy it from me, uh, things like that. I personally work really hard on not wasting any of it. Yeah. I have other friends um who there's so many pigs they literally will just shoot them and drag them off and put them in a pile because they're never ending they can shoot 10 hogs in one night and tomorrow there's 50 more on their property because it's like this never ending remember like galaga the video game where the, the things come down yeah and just, or centipede yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, it's, it, it feels that like never that. Ends. it feels like that with hogs they have a stigma that they're gross and you shouldn't eat them they're pig meat they taste like pigs. They're, and they're really lean there's no fat on them Right. Yeah, there's typically not a lot of fat, so I just add a little bit of pig fat. That's the one thing I learned from from watching alone mm -hmm. was you can still starve yeah. if you're if you're not getting enough, enough fat. fat. Yeah. yeah, and they call it rabbit starvation. Some people call it that because you can have an abundance of rabbits in a survival situation, but there's no fat on them. Mm. And so your body's just consuming itself to, to try to regulate. Yeah. Um there's le there's enough fat on a wild hog to sustain, mm -hmm. but it's not like a a raised farm hog. Right, right. Which is right. covered in fat. Um, and that we would render for lard and things like that. Um, but no, I do. I just, uh, and go out there. I've got a couple of different rifles that we might shoot during the day. And then at night I have thermal scopes that I can see the body temperature of the animals. Mm -hmm. And when they come in, we shoot at them. And then I walk, like if you, I went out with you, you'd be, you'd shoot one or I, even if either one of us shot one, I would teach you how to field dress it, which in other words is take all of its guts out. Mm -hmm. And then we would bring it here. We would wash it, we'd skin it. And then I would. I have all of the equipment necessary, and I would teach you 
how to process the animal like a butcher would and then put it in your freezer. I'm just thinking of <laughs> no. multiple choice. Would you rather jump out of an airplane, <laughs> gut a wild pig? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. I think I'll gut the wild pig, but... It's oh messy and dirty. God, there's no there's so... no way around it. It's not pretty. Yeah. Yeah, it's not. I mean, but it's kind of like... I, that's partly why I want to have the experience. I want to experience things that... Yes. That in life, you know, just are part of normal life to be honest mm -hmm. right like yeah. i eat pigs right and and so i don't want to be one of those persons that's disconnected completely to my food that's my oldest son so he's not a hunter right he's mm -hmm. like my second son down like he has a passion for wilderness mm -hmm. survive for he wants to be a game biologist right or or some having something to do with managing game and being in that field um, but Caleb my oldest he, he has no real ambition to be a hunter or and it's not like the most pleasant but he goes once a year with us just just to do it to keep in practice because he thinks it's just a viable skill to know right uh, and to not ever become com he, he'll tell you this not me ever become complacent on where our food comes that we buy you know and he's like I, I so every year he typically get a, a pig and he'll right here inside of the house and we'll process it and he'll he'll do the work necessary yeah. just to kind of keep himself in check you know yeah yeah um and to keep his kind of skills going um but he's he's not like me where i mean i just i'll go out if, if i could have a career and just go do that instead of everything else i do i go hunt and and have a good and camp and spend all my time out outdoors i would yeah um i love doing it you know uh, but not everybody does or even understands but i've got a solid six or seven friends now who have become pretty ad adamant hunters who before hanging out with me and me taking them hunting um were anti hunters or anti gun if you will right 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 uh and it changes your perspective when once again in the philosoph philosophy is you got to know what's going on either why the supermarket's bare mm -hmm. or have an attachment or some at least idea of what it is it takes to to, to you know to to make that food. I think, yeah, yeah it's just an, an, an awareness of life. Like, yeah, that's 100% what it literally, is. Literally, like, we grow up, we start f seeing things in the world, but, like, there's blinders everywhere still. Mm -hmm, you, mm -hmm. you know, you can't see everything. You can't know everything. But, yeah, this, you know, hunting is, is something that, that uh, I respect. I've mm -hmm. never done it. I've fished. Yeah, yeah. It, well, I mean, that's a type of hunting. To fish at once. Yeah. You one, have one time. You did? Yeah. yeah. Would you oh, snag yeah. one two or they, they, they no? It was we, I. I had two hooks and my. I used to go with my uncle and my dad in yeah. East, Eastern Washington. Sure, sure. And trout fishing, rainbow trout mainly. And one day I just threw it out there, and right at the same time, just two bam! Hooks they out. both so, slammed him. Yeah. Man, my. You need to tell Liam. He would be jealous. He wants to go up there and trout fish. He loves fly fishing. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, it's great. Yeah. I mean, I. I also. Um almost cut my finger off smoking the fish yeah <laughs> preparing the fish to yeah, smoke. Yeah, yeah 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 just oh like, <laughs> you cleaning the fish and well preparing cleaning them. the fish and then uh i think where i actually did it was make chopping the wood mm -hmm. for the smoker with the apple wood we'd put in and so my you know my dad would teach me you know go like that and just one time i just didn't unhook yeah oh yeah enough, and i and when I you're doing chop, the kidney, yeah. I chop my thumb oh <sighs> but you know you got a pretty scar to, to at least to you know, you got a battle wound. Two fish, yeah. one thumb. There you go. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but you know, I you know, I, I just I would uh, I have good memories of of fishing and, mm -hmm. and just being outdoors. And, yeah, yeah. I, I you know I tend to sometimes you know run my mouth you know and I'm and I, I, I if we're if we eat meat if we're meat eaters and you're not once again not a vegetarian or even even full vegan. Um, but you're a, a person who's like, and but you're anti hunting. That's I I consider that hypocritical. That's, that's a hypocrite. yeah. That's yeah. a weird one. Yeah, yeah. That, you can't. You kind of can't do that mm -hmm. if you've got this philosophical belief that there's something wrong with that. Because um, it is, and and quite hap quite frankly, it's it is way healthier. Because mm -hmm. we're not eating meat pumped full of you know company corporate prepacket you know, hormones yeah. and antibiotics and all the crazy things. You know that. The, the alternative for the animal that I might shoot and it dies in an instant is it gets eaten by mountain lions while it's still alive. Like that's a awful thing to think about, right? Yeah, or wolves yeah. or, you know, any other thing. Um, I've read but, a lot of books about Alaska and like, Oh yeah. 
there's and just a brown lot bear, of just, and, yeah. just like wolves attacking mm-hmm. d- deer, mm-hmm. eating out their ass. You know, you can just, see it on. <laughs> I mean, we can watch you know any really awesome thing on Netflix of nature. You nature know, shows, and yeah. and they're gonna show the pack of lions or the cheetahs, or they're gonna show they're gonna show the predator, uh, uh, you know, stalking and attacking prey, and then I mean. Come on, let's be real. The, those poor animals are still bleeding, I'm like eh, making noise alive, when the yeah. ions. Yeah. Um, so, but if we are as human beings, going to say, you know, we we of course I mean, you know, I throw my steaks on the grill. Let's talk about like a just a basic suburban guy or whatever, mm-hmm. a city guy, and you know, we're having the the trendiest of new you know chicken recipe that's out or tacos, but we're not willing to talk about the fact, like understand where that meat came from. I I would consider that hypocritical. Yeah. Uh, myself. Now I'm not walking around pointing fingers and judging people. Like my way of combining that is like, hey, I'll take you anytime. You know, hey, why don't we get you involved in what it is? Even if you go once, you will have a better appreciation for what will the circle of life yeah. and how we live than anybody else. At the, you put once again, just put you one step ahead of the game in that regard. And then you know, history is rife with stories of something happening you know guy you know plane crashes and you're stuck in the woods or you know like uh, the shackletons who who, you know shackleton who went up into to go to arctic circle and they got stranded and had to survive in his leadership you know they had to survive there uh or there was just a, a girl they they plane crashed in um like in the amazon somewhere and she like was 14 years old had to figure out how to survive and two weeks later they found her and she was still alive because she had candy and she had some basic like knew what to eat skills you know mm. um it's just helping <laughs> one of <laughs> my know? favorite books hatchet the hat yeah it's a hatchet. great book oh, yeah so yeah good. it's yeah, a really about, good book yeah gary paulson 100 mm-hmm. percent. we have it upstairs all my kids it's i'd say so most good. of my kids have read it and all you know? of the books that he wrote sort mm-hmm. of like along the there's like a series that he yeah. wrote with the same character yeah and, and they're and they're all well done oh they're great books and and like jack london's books right Mm -hmm. just anything having to do with what it takes to survive and go through things or and i don't read a lot of fiction but when i do it's that type of fiction right love it um of you know the human spirit and our connection with nature and animals and and all that kind of stuff i think it's awesome yeah i I do appreciate those stories whether they're fictional or non-fiction in in, you know in regard like hatchet and things like that yeah um and like and call the wild and 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 all those are such awesome stories yeah so to close it off yeah is there is there any book people should should get a manual for survival um there's a lot of different books out there uh i have a whole video on kind of the types of books i think people should get and, okay and there's kind of a series of like i want you to have at least one like small homesteading book well some of it has to do with where you are like if sure. you live in the country you live in, in most country folk kind of survival's baked in with some things you know what i mean because right. country. but regardless uh, if you national, live in the city yeah if you live in like a so if you live in the city building. or you're suburban or you're just a general like anybody else and you're like okay i'm considering Okay, Josh, you're kind of making sense, or you're an idiot, or whatever you want to think. But um, National Geographic did a book, and I, I it's actually in my work truck. I was letting another person borrow it. Um, uh, called the Survivalist Handbook, I believe it's called. Okay, uh, and it's a really good book uh, through National Geographic. There are lots of prepper books. I have some that, I, but that's my favorite one. Um, is the National Geographic um the survival book that they have i can even it's kind of like the internet for dummies yeah it is because it what it is is um you know how national geographic for the last you know 40 years has been going out into the wilderness and you know Mm. doing all kinds of stuff well what they have are stories of the people who've actually been on mission i say on mission you know have gone you know either they're studying apes or they're helping you know build a hospital in a third world country and uh, trials they had to endure and sure. and the reality of what they did to do that while they're out serving and and finding out about nature and doing all those things um, and stories of like where they almost died or somebody else did and what they learned from it and why it's important that we all have some amount of some amount of like even just, like you said something is better than nothing mm-hmm. you know and I just don't want us to be a draw on the system when it's more important that we be instead of consuming that we can you know, right, produce. Right, right, right. Uh, and that's where my heart lies on everything I'm doing. Now, I try to make it funny and lighthearted, um, but that that book, 
I, I want to look up the exact title so that, and I can give you a link to the description for it. So you can put, sure. I don't know, you can put it in your description. Yeah, we'll put it, we'll put uh, yeah. links in. Uh, the, in fact, in that's the what notes. I'll do. If anybody wants to know what book it is, once the episode comes out, there'll be uh, just a link links, on, yeah. on one or two books. And I'm like, hey, just go read these and you can get started because uh, they're really good ones. I'm also going to put the link to your site. Okay, is reasonably, reasonablyprepared.com. Mm hmm. Um, and yes, we do a podcast. You can, it's on all the directories. We come out with podcasts, um, at least once a month, but we try to do every other, every other week. Uh, and then the YouTube channel itself reasonably cool. prepared. Uh, if anybody has any questions or wants me to make content surrounding anything, I'm happy to do it. I want to do it. Just email me, um, uh, reasonably prepared at gmail.com. Just email me and say, hey, I heard you on uh, Mike's podcast and I was thinking about this. What do you recommend? And I'll either make contact or I'll email directly because, once again, I will talk with anybody anywhere on just, once again, d d taking authority and responsibility over our own lives. And, and I find it to be fun and engaging and mm -hmm. helpful. Yeah. yeah, as opposed to yeah. the opposite of that. Uh, so all of those places you can go do that. I have to say thank you, man. You're so generous. You've been generous with my kids, my family. Uh, what a wonderful human being. I'm super grateful. I just need to say it. Uh, and to have me on, on your podcast, uh, it does help me, and it'll help me get the message out for what it is I'm trying to accomplish with this um, so that if people are starting to research preparedness and it goes from like, how much toilet paper to have to living in a bunker surrounded by yeah. guns and ammo? Like almost immediately, <laughs> yeah. there's some there's a different there's a different avenue you could do, right? Yeah, um, yeah. So I, I am very grateful, man. What a blessing, seriously, well, dude. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it, man. You don't have to say such nice things about me. I'm a bum. I just hang. But too late. Already but thank you. Take it back. Appreciate it. The whole man. What are your whole family? My kids love your kids, and they're having a great time. So absolutely. Um, I hope. You're about to get out of the heat, too, so go back up to Bremerton where there's real <laughs> good weather. I endure this because my wife's from the south, but, man, it's rough. <laughs> it's rough. It's, it's getting warm down here. It's so muggy it right is. now down here. But I'm, it's nice and cool in this studio, so. Oh, yeah. we got the little AC kick in Beautiful. there. And, Beautiful. So, awesome. Once again, thanks, everyone out there. Uh, keep keep listening to Mike's podcast because they're awesome. <laughs> and, and all of that, all the, all, the, all the good formalities you can say to another person. You heard it from Joshua. Reasonably yep. prepared. Appreciate it. All right. Yep. Blessings, man. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye, everybody.